is our second year of three years doing this together as a church in which we are looking at the seven sayings of Christ from the cross. And so we're going to continue that today. And I want you to turn to Luke chapter 23. And as you're turning there, I want to say this about the words we consider today. These words are printed, if you have a red letter Bible, in red. But like all the words of Christ, all the words of Scripture, but especially in words such as this, they deserve to be printed in letters of gold. Because these words we're about to read today are the eternal Word of God, and they have been used to change the lives of countless myriads, thousands upon thousands of those who have encountered them, and God has spoken through them. So, if you will join me. We will read together God's Word, Luke 23, for context. We'll start at verse 33, and we'll read to verse 43, though we're just going to focus on the last two today. Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 33. The Scripture says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified Him. They crucified Jesus. And the criminals the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Notice, an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Here's our text today. Then this criminal said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, truly, amen, verily I say to you, today... You will be with me in paradise. This is the word of our Lord. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Lord, we come now on this Resurrection Sunday. And we ask, oh God, that today this word of salvation would be alive in our hearts. That we would have the same assurance that man had on the cross next to Christ. That today, your resurrection, your salvation as the living God, would be a reality to us this morning. And Lord, for each one that's come here today, that we would leave here changed, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done, O Christ, in dying and rising again. So help us now to worship you as we consider your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. This passage is full of contrasts. We had a longer period of time, I would point them all out to you, but I would just like to draw two of them to your attention this morning. First off, we see a contrast between the Roman soldiers, the religious leaders, the crowds who are mocking Jesus, who are ridiculing him, who are literally blaspheming him and attacking him verbally with insults and terrible words, contrasted with Jesus, who only responds in what way? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And then we see a contrast, secondly, that we're going to focus on today between two criminals hanging on, other, on the other side of Jesus. We see one who ridicules him. We're told in the Gospel of Matthew's account that both of them started out ridiculing Jesus, but Luke only points out the one ridiculing, but then one of them believes on Jesus. Something changes drastically. This great contrast happens where one is profaning Jesus' name and one of them begins to worship and defend Jesus' name. And today we want to hear how this conversation changed this man's life forever. And I pray it would change your life. The word of salvation spoken here on the cross 
showing us Jesus is our King and our Savior and Lord would change your life as well. So if you'll look with me, first off, we are told there are two criminals in this story. The Geneva Bible called them evildoers. The King James calls them malefactors. Some translations render this word revolutionaries or criminals. These are not petty thieves, friends. These are not individuals who are just common robbers. These men are receiving the death penalty this day. They are cruel bandits. They are probably murderers, men of abandoned character who tormented and slaughtered their victims. And so they are getting a death penalty on this cross next to Jesus. And as we see this here, I can't help but associate them possibly with Barabbas. If you remember, Barabbas was supposed to die this day, and Jesus has taken his very place on the cross. And we are told Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer. And so maybe these three were destined to die together, but now Jesus is in between these two men. Now, I want to say to you today, how amazing is this? It is no accident at all that Jesus is being crucified between two robbers, criminals, possibly murderers. I want you to understand today, friends, that there are no accidents in a world governed by God. Much less could there have ever been an accident on the day of all days, the very center of the history of the world, when Jesus dies on the cross. This was not by chance or happenstance. From all eternity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had decreed that Jesus would die this day. That he would be a lamb slain. From all eternity, everything was planned out. Nothing was left to chance. So while Pilate gave the orders to have Jesus crucified between these two thieves, while it was unknown to him, this was the eternal decree of God. You see, the prophet Isaiah, I have it on the screen, 700 years earlier, had given this promise. He said that the Messiah, the Savior, would be pouring out his soul unto death, and he would be numbered, he would die, he would be counted with the transgressors. In other words, he would not die alone. He would be right there, surrounded by the wicked at his death. How amazing this is, that the Holy One of God at this very moment, is numbered, he is counted with the unholy. The one whose finger inscribed the law of God on the tablets of stone is the one here who is being executed in the place of the lawless. I cannot help but read this and say, Oh God, your word is true. You promised this, you decreed it, it happened. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now why in the world would God have Jesus die this horrific death between two criminals, and why would he record this conversation for us today? Well, I want to give you a few reasons. First off, Jesus was crucified between two thieves in the same way Jesus came into the world in the depths of shame, surrounded by the beasts of the field. His whole life was a life of humility, of poverty, of brokenness. He was rejected of men. He was born into this world and there was no room for him in the end. He had to literally be born in a manger, in a stable among animals. Brothers and sisters, consider this today and recognize that from the beginning to the end, Jesus in humility endured these things because he loves us. Secondly, I want you to note here that we see the absolute contempt they had for Jesus. Pilate wants to legitimatize this decree that he has made, which he knows is unjust, to kill Jesus. And so what does he do? He has Jesus crucified with two of the worst kind of criminals he could come up with. Associates, maybe a Barabbas. To make the point that he was justified in what he has just done. And I will say this, Jesus is in the center of two thieves. He is in the place of dishonor. The greatest dishonor and disjustice at the center of sinful humanity, Jesus is at this very moment. But number three, I think the reason why Christ is put on the cross here like this, numbered with the transgressors, is to show us that he has come to take our place. He has come to take not only Barabbas' place, but your place and my place, the place of shame, the place of brokenness, the place of criminals condemned to death. When Martin Luther preached on this passage, this is what he said. He said, Our most merciful Father sent His only Son into the world and laid upon Him the sins of all men. It was like on the cross, He said, Be Peter the denier. Be Paul the persecutor, the blasphemer, the cruel oppressor. Be David the adulterer. 
be that sinner Adam, which ate of the fruit in paradise. I don't think it was an apple. It had to be something much more gross than that, right? <laughs> the thief which hung upon the cross. Be the person which committed the sins of all men. See, therefore, that you pay and you satisfy for their sins. At this moment, Jesus is in the center of this situation because he is taking not only the sins of a thief next to him, a robber, a criminal next to him, but he is taking the sins of all of sinful humanity at this very moment. I want you to think, friends, that Jesus in his whole life was committed to loving the lost, to loving sinners. Jesus spent time with sinners. I want you to understand today that the church is a place for sinners. In other words, if you came here today and you felt unworthy to be here, I want you to understand something. There is no one worthy. If you walked into the church today and you were on the lookout for the perfect church, I hate to break the news to you, when I walked in the doors, it became unperfect, and you just added to the mess. There is no perfect church. There's a perfect Savior who takes the sins of the church on Himself. I want us to know we are all thieves of the worst type. Until we see ourselves like these, these men, like this thief, we will never be right with God. We have robbed God. You say, not me, I'm a sinner, I'll admit that, but I'll never say I'm a thief. Well, you've robbed God with your time, with your talents, with your toys, men, with your treasures. We have robbed God. We have not given him that which is due. And we will see this more clearly in just a few moments. Now, we look at verses 42 and 43. And we see here the prayer of a dying sinner to a dying Savior. The prayer of a dying sinner to a dying Savior. Notice, we see a plea and a confession all at once. He cries out, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, this is a marvelously uh, amazing statement here. Think about it. Jesus is nailed to the tree. He is the butt of the vulgar mob's cruel ranting and raving and insults. He is the object of national hatred. He is forsaken even by his own disciples. He is suffering the most shameful punishment ever. Worse than the gallows. Worse than the electric chair. Worse than the gas chamber is the cross. This thief has heard the scornful priest challenge Jesus and say, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. And Jesus gave no response. This thief at this moment is one of the very few people in all the world who recognize Jesus as Lord. The disciples' hope is gone. It's about to be buried with Jesus in the grave as he dies. How in the world is it possible that this man could look at Jesus as Lord and have a life that is changed? Well, I want you to understand today, the salvation that comes to this man only comes because Jesus is Lord. Now, he has no hands to do any work for Jesus, but he has a heart at this moment. And we're going to explain this in detail in a second. But he has a heart that God can work in when everything else is nailed up to a cross. Romans 10 says it this way. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I want you to see here that you cannot have salvation without having Jesus as Lord. You will find it nowhere in the Bible where Jesus is simply the Savior that we just prayed to, but he is not the Lord. The reason why is you can't cut Jesus in half and just have him as Savior and not have him as Lord. God has already made him Lord in Christ. It's not your job to make him Lord. He is Lord. You will either bow to him and worship him like this thief, or you will rebel against him and run from him. But it is not an option whether he is Lord or not. And so today, this thief can't do anything, but this word is so important, Lord. And we're going to hone in on it in just a second. Lord, remember me. He's praying for favor, for acknowledgement. Notice how humble this is. This thief, this robber, this criminal does not say, Lord, honor me. He does not say, Lord, exalt me. Lord, prefer me. Instead, it's, Lord, if you will only think of me, if you only look on me, I'm an outcast from society. My family will probably never talk about me again. I'm going to die on this cross. 
and my nation will never want to think of my name again. I am a disgraced man. My friends are going to be glad to forget my name because I have failed them. This man's interaction is an amazing thing because right here we see that he believed there was another life after this and he desired to be happy in that life, not as the other thief. The other thief was only thinking about getting off that cross. This thief was getting prepared for what was to come. I want to say to you today, if you come to church today and you're like most of us, you've probably prepared in education. You've probably prepared for vacations. I had some good friends uh, recently. They uh, just was watching. They prepared, saved up, and they went on a cruise. They prepared for that event. Some of you in this room, you're preparing for retirement financially. You're putting money away. But how few of us stop and we prepare for eternity, what follows this life. I want to say to you, it's never too late to prepare if God has given you breath. And at this very moment, he stops thinking about this life and he starts thinking about the life that is to come. And he says, remember me in your kingdom. Again, a fascinating statement. Jesus isn't wearing a golden crown. He's wearing a diadem of thorns piercing his skull with blood pouring out of him. Jesus here, instead of being waited on by loyal servants, loving servants, is numbered with criminals. Instead of a crowd of loyal subjects, there's a mob chanting, crucify him. Over the cross, the only thing that's kingly is those words, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And it was placed there to be a mockery. But you see, friends, I want to explain to you something. And this wonderful truth is that the word of God has power where man is powerless. And so while it would seem totally hopeless for this man to have eyes to see Jesus as king, I cannot help but think as he is staggered next to this cross, he sees this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. God begins to do this work in his heart where he realizes this man really is who he says he is. This man really is the king of death, the king of sin, the king of this world, the king that is going to come again and make all things right. And at this very moment, he begins to believe in his heart. This man could run no errands for Jesus. No path of righteousness could be ran for Christ. His feet were nailed to a cross. This man could do no good deeds for Jesus. His hands were nailed to the cross. He could not turn over a new leaf and just try harder and be better because he was dying and his life was about to be gone. But he realizes his sinful condition. He realizes his brokenness. He realizes his helplessness. He realizes that Christ Jesus came into the world not to save the healthy, but the weak, the sick, the broken. And we see here in God's sovereign grace a repentance and faith, a sorrowing and forsaking of sin that is so glorious indeed. Notice first he says to his companion, look at verses 40 and 41. Now remember, we were told they were both mocking Jesus in Matthew, then the one criminal starts mocking Jesus. And look what he says in verse 40 and 41. Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? He sees here that it is sinful and wrong for this man to not only disbelieve Jesus, but to mock Jesus. He sees here his own sin and wickedness when he says that we are indeed dying justly, but this man unjustly. Secondly, notice he does not say, do you not fear punishment or do you not fear hell? But he says, do you not fear God? He looks at Jesus and he has eyes of faith that no one else has. And he doesn't just see a man on the cross. He doesn't just see a martyr on the cross. He sees the son of man, the son of God on the cross. He says, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. He realizes that he's a king at this moment. And whereas before he was mocking him in repentance, now he begins to worship him and celebrate him. Thirdly, he confesses Jesus' innocence. Look what it says in verse 41. This man has done nothing wrong. God has taken great pains to make it clear that Jesus did not sin. We sinned. Jesus took our sin on himself. Pilate said, his wife, Pilate's wife said, have nothing to do with this just man. We are told that Judas, after he betrayed Jesus, went back 
to repent of this, and he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Now, now, Judas lived with Jesus three years. He surely, if there was any sin in Jesus' life, he surely would have seen it. Innocent blood. Pilate said, I have found no fault in him. And now this, this criminal on the cross testifies that Jesus is the sinless Savior. I am the sinner in need of a Savior. Lastly, publicly, he confesses to Jesus and prays to him right there. What a proof that our good works do not save. It is our heart that needs to be saved. Then the works follow. What a proof it is that it is not sacraments that save. You notice the baptism waters didn't save anybody today. This thief could not be baptized. It was his heart that needed to be saved. Then we follow him in baptism, right? It, we took on Friday the Lord's Supper, the communion meal. We commune with Christ and we ate of his flesh and drink of, drank of his blood by faith. But that meal does not save if you don't have a heart full of faith. It is no means of grace without a heart that has turned to Jesus Christ. Then you can take it in remembrance of him. Friends, when we read this here, I realize it's not belonging to the visible church that will save you. Now, if you get saved, you should belong to a visible church. You should take the Lord's Supper regularly. You should be baptized. You should do good works. But it's not being a member of the visible church that saves you. He never could join a church. But when he and his heart turned to Christ, he joined the one true holy church that lasts forever. He is now a member of the family of God. He will never be rejected. Everyone else might belittle him and hate him, but I love the family of God. It accepts you when no one else does. And the Savior brings you in, and he's merciful to you. Look how this ends in verse 43. We are told, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now this is amazing. Jesus immediately answers him. Jesus didn't answer the religious leaders who mocked him. He did not answer the crowds, the mob who ridiculed him. But the prayer of the contrite, of the repentant, no matter how sinful, how messy his life was, that was a prayer that Jesus is willing to answer. Christ is in the greatest struggle and agony at the moment of his greatest weakness. And yet he takes the energy and all what energy it must have took for him to speak as he's literally dying via crucifixion. His lungs are filling up with fluid. He's slowly dying the most painful of deaths. And yet, in these short words, he speaks a word of comfort to the suffering. Friends, I want you to understand something today. Jesus Christ is never too busy to hear you. Amen. A sinner can never come to Jesus in an unacceptable time. Jesus will never delay in giving you the answer you need. What amazing power and willingness. He is able to save us to the uttermost who come from, to him. No matter how messy your life is today. One great preacher of the past who uh, was a gutter drunk, he used to say. He said, God will save us from the guttermost to the uttermost. Doesn't matter how messy your life is. He doesn't save you because your life looks good. He saves you because you need his love. Because he is merciful. He is now as a priest purchasing this happiness for this man on the cross. He is the sacrifice paying the price for our sins. He is the prophet speaking truth into the heart of his son. And he is the king ready to give the kingdom to the son at this very moment. He speaks with authority and power. He says verily or truly or most assuredly. It's the Greek word amen. He doesn't speak here as a defeated martyr. He speaks as the king. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow. Not one day. Not hopefully. Not maybe. At that moment, today is the very day of salvation. In other words, when you come to Christ, you don't have to worry or wonder what God will do with you. This is the day the kingdom began, the day the revolution began, the day the world would never be the same because his kingdom is not of this world. It is eternal. It will last forever. How remarkable. Because you've got to know the context of the first century. When they crucified people, they would usually leave them on the cross for two, three, four days to suffer. It was a slow, tedious, wicked death. 
But Jesus knew that there were circumstances that were not going to allow them to stay on that cross multiple days. Because he's God. He knew the future. And so he doesn't say, you will be with me in paradise soon, which is what a normal person would have said, because they would have expected to be on the cross two, three, four days. But no, Jesus is omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful God, and he has the power to say, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. How amazing it is. This robber may have never prayed before, yet he was now heard and saved with his last breaths. While there is life, there is hope. And while there is hope, there is room for prayer to come to Christ. You will be with me. All he wanted to do is just be remembered. But Jesus says, no, it's greater than that. Your body might be broken and mangled by the Romans, but you will be with me forever. That's our Savior. The word paradise used here is a very interesting word. It's a word It's from a Persian origin. Uh, the, the translators of the Old Testament Bible, when they translated the Old Testament into Greek, they used this word. It's the word paradisios. They used it when they spoke of the Garden of Eden. They called the Garden of Eden paradisios, paradise. It was a word that was used in the first century to speak of not only a garden, but the most beautiful, peaceful place in the face of the earth. And friends, this word is used three times in the New Testament. All of them refer to heaven, leaving this world for the world to come. Think of the contrast here for a minute between the Garden of Eden in the beginning and paradise forever. The earthly paradise, the Garden of Eden, was of God's planning. God planted the garden. And Jesus now on the cross is preparing a place for us. Secondly, the Garden of Eden had a river running through it. So in heaven, the river of God's love, the tree of life, with a variety of other trees for the healing of the nations, for the healing of our broken souls, will be there forever to eat from. The inhabitants of the garden were pure and holy and innocent before God. And so in heaven, there is no sin or suffering or death. All is pure, holy, forever. God walked with man in the Garden of Eden. He communed with man. Today we're separated from God because of sin. But brothers and sisters, in that day, not only in heaven, but the new heavens and new earth, we will be with God. He will be our father. You will be his daughter. You will be his son. And we will live with him forever and ever. Notice here, no moral resume is required to be finally accepted into heaven. All that is required is our acknowledgement of our sin and our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. Jesus is making it clear here. He will defeat death. He will rise again. He will spread his grace in the world. Listen, Jesus is about to die. This thief is about to die. And the reality is because of the first man, Adam, we have all died in our sins. Dead men cannot save themselves. They can't turn to God on their own. We are broken before God. We have lied. We have said things that are not true, making us liars. We have stolen, making us thieves, taken things that don't belong to us. We have blasphemed God's name, used it as a four-letter filthy word. We have dishonored his law. We have hated in our heart, making us guilty of murder in heart. We have committed adultery, and if we haven't done it physically, we've looked with lust in our eyes. We are lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterer at hearts, murderer at hearts. We are robbers. We are criminals in the sight of God. All of our sins are different, but they are all going to be held to the account one day. Dead in our sins. But because Jesus rose from the grave, he could guarantee that you can have life today. That the sin can be taken away. That you can be forgiven. That he won't look at you as a liar anymore. He won't look at you as a thief anymore. He won't look at you as an adulterer anymore. As a murderer at heart anymore. As a blasphemer anymore. Jesus doesn't want to look at you that way anymore. He will not look at you as a judge anymore. The judgment was taken on the cross. And if you turn to him, God will be your father. And Christ will receive you to himself forever. Amen. How beautiful this gospel is here today. This is how powerful the gospel is. Just think about this as I close. Before his salvation, this criminal did not respect the law of God or the law of man. He was guilty in the courts of men and the courts of God. He had robbed, probably murdered to receive the death penalty. He had even slandered his creator right there that very day on the cross. 
This thief had marched along the streets of Jerusalem and probably seen Jesus fall under the weight of the cross. He had seen the enemies triumph over Christ for a moment. He had seen the disciples forsake Christ. Public opinion was against this man. There was no one in the audience at that moment saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There was no one there witnessing to who Jesus was at that moment. This is a conversion that takes place before the great supernatural phenomena of that day. He believes before the sky is dark for those three hours. He believes before Jesus says it is finished. He believes before the veil of the temple is rent in two, before the quaking and shivering of the rocks, before the centurion said, truly this is the Son of God. He believes before all these things with a mangled and almost dead body waiting for the last stroke of his executioner, he relies on the grace of God alone. John 1 says it this way, as many as received him. It's on the screen, look at it. John 1, 12. As many as received him, he gave the right to be called the children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, this is an amazing picture. J.C. Ryle said it this way, there was one thief saved that no sinner would despair, but only one was saved that no sinner might presume. Don't think you can wait till your last day to get right with God. One thief waited too long. Friend, are you presuming that one day you're going to get right with God? Jesus says, today is the day. Today is the day. Even those who reach the dying hour, you are not beyond hope. I want to close and tell you about a great artist. You know his name, surely Rembrandt. He was one of the great Dutch masters of art. And Rembrandt was a professing Christian. He had a complicated life, as many of us do in this room. But most of his paintings and etchings were of biblical events. If you go online, you can look at them. Just amazing stuff. And there's two paintings in particular I want to point out to you today because they're quite fascinating. The first one is entitled The Three Crosses. And you see it here on the screen. Now, what's so fascinating about this picture is first off, uh, Rembrandt wanted to try to picture everyone who was involved in the death of Jesus. So he has the centurion, he has the Romans, he has the Jews, the common Jews, he has the religious leaders. He has the two thieves on the cross. Uh, you'll notice there's darkness on the one thief on the left, and there's light on the other thief on the right. One believes, one rejects. But what's kind of interesting, I never knew this until recently, is that Rembrandt, because he believed that he was also guilty of Jesus' death and put Jesus on the cross, we are told by many art scholars that Rembrandt, in the shadow almost hidden, put a representation of himself. For he recognized it was his sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. And so on the way right, there's this little uh, just shadow of an individual, and that was Rembrandt himself. The next picture is another one that he painted, the raising of Christ, being raised to the cross. Now this one's really easy to figure out who Rembrandt is. Now, he's this guy underneath the cross. He doesn't look the part, does he? But he's there. I show you those pictures today because I want to say to you today, until you recognize that it is your sins that put Christ to the cross, you will never have the forgiveness you need. But today, if you turn to him and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his amazing grace will come into you. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you new life. He will set you free. He will change you from this day forth and forevermore. Would you bow with me in prayer? Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. 
And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.